Welcome to the HIGN webinar series addressing current trends and issues impacting the health and well being of older Americans. I'm Dr. Tara Cortez, the Executive Director of the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing and a professor at NYU Myers College of Nursing. Our program today, The Case for Pace Expansion, features national leaders who will discuss the opportunities for supporting this important community-based program for older adults. Let me first introduce you to our panel. Dr. Eileen Sullivan Marks has been Dean of the New York University Rory Myers College of Nursing and the Arlene Perkins McGriff Professor of Nursing since 2012. She's known for her research and innovative approaches to primary care and her redesign of payment structures for nurses through the Medicaid and Medicare programs. Prior to coming to NYU, Dr. Sullivan Marks was the Associate Dean for Practice and Community Affairs at University of Pennsylvania and Faculty Director of the Living Independently for Elders or the LIFE program, a PACE initiative to improve care for vulnerable and high-risk older adults in West Philadelphia. She's currently the president of the American Academy of Nursing. Mr. Peter Fitzgerald is the executive vice president for policy and strategy at the National PACE Association. In this position, Mr. Fitzgerald guides the association's policy and advocacy efforts at the federal and state level to support its strategic priorities. He leads the PACE 2.0 initiative to expand access to and use of PACE nationally. Before his current position at NPA, Mr. Fitzgerald served as the Senior Vice President for Integrated Care Strategies at Volunteers of America, where he was responsible for planning and development of a new PACE programs nationally. For more than a decade, Mr. Scott LaRue has been an advocate for older adults in New York as president and chief executive officer of ArchCare, the nonprofit healthcare system of the Archdiocese of New York. As CEO, Mr. LaRue has spearheaded more than $200 million in capital improvements across ArchCare's ministry. One significant area of growth for the system under his leadership has been the expansion of ArchCare's PACE division called Senior Life which consists of a multidisciplinary team working in partnership to improve every aspect of participants' care. ArchCare's PACE program has grown from a single site in Harlem to seven PACE centers across New York City and Westchester. And the growth has been further accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And our other panelists is Dr. Rob Schreider, who is currently the Vice President and Medical Director of Summit Elder Care and has been in the role for the past four years. Summit Elder Care is a PACE program with over 1,200 participants. It's one of the largest PACE programs in the country. He is a geriatrician and internist on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. Dr. Schreiber is the chairperson of the National PACE Medical Director Committee and has worked to scale PACE nationally. We'll have a brief presentation from each panelist and then have a discussion amongst them. We'll address questions from the audience during the last 15 minutes of the program. Please enter your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box. Use the Q&A box for questions and use the chat box only for comments you might wish to make. There's a slight change in the program today as Dean Sullivan Marks, who was to moderate today's program, has a travel schedule that might interfere with her ability to be with us the entire hour and might in interfere with her broad, her, broad bath, her broadband ability. So therefore I'll moderate, but Dean Sullivan Marks will make a few introductory remarks before our panelists begin. Dr. Sullivan Marks. Thank you, Dr. Cortez. It's really um, great to have the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing present this uh, important panel and our experts today. I know that those of you in the audience will really enjoy this discussion. I hope that some of you are new to the uh, PACE model and new in interest because those of us who've been involved in PACE for decades um, um, want to expand and reach out. So. Why is it important to have this PACE seminar uh, right now following the pandemic? I think there's an open opportunity now as we recognize not only the kind of care um, that became so evident, home-based care um, with integrated, the need for integrated community, long-term care and hospitalization care during COVID and the absence of that 
coordination and integration leads to worse outcomes. PACE has been showing for decades that the integration of the care, the finance model, family and community makes such a huge difference. On the other hand, PACE is a complicated finance and um, community-based model because you're integrating everything. And it is wonderfully um, in a position because it is supported by Medicare and Medicaid in the state level, but also that means that there's always regulations that need adjustment and tweaking over time, not only because of the changes in healthcare financing, but because the changes in clinical care um, as we move forward. Uh, what was once an alternative to nursing home care has become a very com complex, but, but with the ability to integrate complex, frail healthcare in a supportive way. Um, as a senior fellow over a decade ago with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, I worked on opportunities to adjust uh, some of the PACE regulations, but also to uh, look at why couldn't we expand PACE everywhere. Um, PACE is a community and family-based model. That is core to how the care is delivered. So that involves the ability for people to be able to supportively live at home and as well live in a community uh, and have a, a safe um, home base. When we were in West Philadelphia, we invested not only um, with families and housing, but also in the community for supportive senior living. And you'll hear some of that today. I think another thing to keep in mind is that PACE is the only Medicare uh, program that requires and pays for integrated teams. And that uh, I think is very unique and key and something that we all know in the aging field is important to um, focus on, but so often it's not covered or paid for. But in the PACE program, not only is it paid for, but it's required. Um, the other point I want to make is that as healthcare interprofessional uh, work has developed over decades, so has the ability to use that interprofessional care in a uh, PACE program. So you'll hear how uh, some of the um, programs um, in different states use that type of uh, team-based care and flex it so that it's appropriate to each particular uh, older adult in the PACE program. So I'm gonna stop there, Tara, and let your uh, other panelists make their opening remarks. And I look forward um, for as long as I can uh, to hear uh, about what the panel has to say. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for putting up with my schedule. Thank you, Eileen. Dr. Schreiber, you're gonna kick it off followed by Mr. LaRue and then Mr. Fitzgerald. All right, thank you, Dr. Cortez. And I appreciate the opening comments from Dr. Sullivan Marks and the opportunity to present today uh, to this uh, esteemed group. What I'm gonna to try to do is kick off uh, the importance of PACE. And as we go through the changes that are now being sort of accelerated as a result of the COVID pandemic, the importance of value-based care, that is sort of where the health system is going. And I wanna really just focus and give a taste of the PACE model and how it not only is a value-based care system, but that it's actually an age-friendly health system. And I'll uh, define that as we go forward. So the first thing I just wanna let people know, I don't have disclosures or conflict of interest. And a lot of the opinions I'm expressing are personal ones. Um, I do work for Fallon Health, which is based out of Worcester, Mass. Um, and even though a lot of the comments I have are um, supported by Fallon, uh, a lot of the thoughts I have will be personal ones. So I just wanna make certain that's clear. We sort of talked about, and in the introduction that Dr. Cord has uh, mentioned, you know, the numbers of people we have, but our average age participants about 80 and they have a 3.5 year life expectancy. This here is the center, our flagship center uh, on Grove Street in downtown Worcester. And um, we have approximately 380 participants 
in this building, um, you know, give or take over, you know, the course of a week. 34% um, of our participants live in assisted livings uh, facilities. That's a big number and it's growing. And we are also increasing supportive housing and about 8.5% live in long-term care nursing homes. So just to give you a taste of what we uh, have here. And again, we are the seventh largest PACE program. So in terms of what PACE tries to do, I wanna make this sort of more of a, a personal observation of what I got into PACE for. And this was an amalgam of a number of opportunities and over the years. And specifically the way I look at PACE or any type of care system that cares for older adults is to allow frail older adults who have complex needs and ADL dependency to live with the dignity and independence guided by what matters most to them. Their healthcare needs are met reliably and well with the sense of well being and inclusion in personal relationships and in the community. In so doing, the cost will be sustainable for families and the larger society. So that's sort of the North Star. And I would say that most of the individuals in the interdisciplinary team actually have similar views, but it's really important that the model and the individuals working there, you know, have this North Star as well as um, making certain that we're all sort of doing the same thing to reach that North Star, or focus on that North Star with the individuals and or family members. So I mentioned Aid Friendly Health System, and this is a concept and initiative that was actually started by the John A. Hart Hartford Foundation and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And Aid Friendly Systems are now aimed at practices, primary care practices. It could be an adult day center. It does not have to be a big complex academic healthcare system. Um, but it could be. And so um, if you actually Google age-friendly health systems, you can actually get a list of, I, there are hundreds of organizations now that are espousing to be um, age-friendly. And what that really means is that the organization is dedicated to following an essential set of evidence-based practices. The focus is to cause no harm and align with what matters to the older adult and family caregivers. And they're the, the, the aspect of the evidence-based approach is really focusing on four M's. These are sort of geriatric tried and true principles, which is one focusing on what matters, medication management, mentation, and mobility. These are the core essence of good geriatric and medical care for older adults that systems need to focus on and use evidence-based approaches. So that's really where PACE really excels. And again, being very um, clinically as well as socially focused to allow the needs of the individual to be met in their environment, in the community, uh, to you know, live their best possible life. So the question is, is this like, um, it's, you know, is this really rocket science or is it not? Um, and I would just offer that in terms of what we're trying to do in terms of the quadruple aim, it is sort of rocket science, trying to get all these things to align, focusing on what matters to the individual and then aligning care um, in a system that oftentimes has not focused on what matters is incredibly complex and challenging. And again, our focus and every system of care, you know, ideally espouses these, this quadruple aim, which is better health for the people we care for, we want better care, so the quality care is better. We want ideally lower costs, so if we're doing the care that's appropriate, ideally lower costs should be there. And the importance, and I think the pandemic has actually highlighted this, the importance of staff satisfaction. But we can't forget it's about the individuals we care for and or their families. And so participant directed care is in the middle, so how you would weave this together is oftentimes the challenge. And so what I come up with is sort of um, a playbook is needed and all of these things are necessary in terms of making 
a model of care specifically around PACE to be successful. And this is just really a touch of the, of the issues. These are the major ones. There are others that I have not included just because of time, but these are the big ones. And the first is focusing on the four M's, like I said. And specifically, there are evidence-based approaches which we can talk about, but I don't want to you know, do that right now. Um, Dr. Mark Sullivan um, talked about the interdisciplinary team. That is really critical. We have 11 mandated disciplines. Actually, I think there should be more, but at least 11 that are really critical and their voices are equal. And if you include, however, the participant as the captain of that team, um, really understanding again, what that individual wants and needs is really critical. The integration of the medical behavioral health and, and a palliative approach is really also essential. And this is in the context of the community. And I didn't bring the community into this, but the assumption is that if you're living in the community, that's sort of your, your fabric. And so you have to then again, understand what individuals opportunities and needs are in that community. And it can be very varied depending on the, the, the people and the, and the sites where you're working from and the population and the cultural characteristics of those populations. We also need to have practical consistencies though. You know, as these um, PACE programs and other systems grow, being able to have consistent approaches, standardization of, of care for at least 80% of what we do, and then being able to individualize it to the needs of the of the person are really critical. We have to be highly reliable. That means that the results that we get, we can promise that we're going to deliver and we have to deliver on those results. It's also important to capture the cost of care. So you can have great care, but if you don't have a margin, you don't have a mission. And so capturing that cost of care and really being able to do it in a compliant way is absolutely essential because as, and I think maybe Peter will go through this, the cost of the care of an individual in this program is extremely large and high. The growth and value proposition, having individuals, their families, systems of care, community-based organization, government, they need to understand why this model is so attractive and why it can make a big difference. And so actually having that value proposition is really critical. And I think the last thing which is needed for not only a PACE program, but all organizations, is that we need to be learning organizations. And when we have failures or systems that are not optimizing, incorporating lean principles or the Toyota production system in a way that we can actually learn and improve the care that we're given. So just in terms of what uh, bringing this into a quantitative way, these are key performance indicators for PACE programs. Um, and this was in 2019, and these are key performance indicators. And again, my goal is not to go through these, but to say, okay, for a population that has risk adjustment that is complex, what would you normally see? And I would just put out there that these numbers are actually pretty, um, pretty good. I think they're actually better now for many reasons one of which was the pandemic, um, not allowing people necessarily to go out and do care but in, in, and get care. But I think in general, um, we'll continue to see these numbers improve as the model matures and as we engage uh, more with the four Ms. So again, these are just benchmark data that other systems can look at. But again, you would obviously wanna have risk adjustment and make certain you're performing uh, populations that are similar. So in summary, I want to just go through the, the points that I, I was trying to make, one which is value-based care should focus on what matters to the individual and meeting their needs reliably. We need to also being able to focus on the four M's in terms of meeting that quadruple aim. I don't want to underestimate the importance of having staff engagement. And as you know, keeping staff engaged and employed um, with that and decreasing turnover has been a big challenge for most healthcare systems as well as other employer groups. Multiple aspects of care and management must be done by the interdisciplinary team and the administrative support is needed to really remove barriers so that we can have success in this model. 
And PAYS programs are learning organizations really focused on home and community-based care and will continue to evolve in that manner as the needs of individuals are put forth front and center. So with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Scott LaRue. Good, good morning. Is my share screen going, uh, Dr. Cortez? Not yet, there, there it is. Okay, perfect. Good morning and uh, thank you, uh, Doctor, for uh, the introduction and the opportunity to participate on this panel. Uh, I really believe that PACE right now is in the most unique opportunity and we have to take this opportunity uh, to advance uh, this wonderful care model for the people that we serve. I like to start out with our mission statement because I think it defines why Arch Care as a ministry has decided that PACE is the strategic direction we're going for the people we serve. And that's because our mission is to provide holistic care to frail and vulnerable people. And that's exactly what PACE does. It provides holistic care. It looks at the entire individual community that they live in, their family, their social settings, and puts a plan in place that allows them to remain as independent and in that community that they grew up in and loved for as long as possible. As Dr. Cortez mentioned, we operate a number of PACE centers here in the New York City metropolitan area. Uh, I want to review just a few of the background about PACE for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, but it is for individuals that are 55 and older uh, who otherwise would be eligible for nursing home admission. So this program uh, is, as was mentioned, uh, provide community-based care for individuals who otherwise um, would end up in a nursing home or could. PACE fully integrates, coordinates, and pays for the continuum of Medicare and Medicaid services. There was a question that came in the chat button about dental services. Uh, dental services are included. And when I refer back to the mission statement and we talk about the holistic approach to the people we serve, this is what we're talking about. It is the only program that fully integrates all of these benefits into one coordinated effort by the interdisciplinary care team. The PACE programs have been very successful in demonstrating uh, reduced hospitalizations, readmissions to hospitals, and a reliance on emergency medical services. It is unquestionable that PACE has demonstrated the ability uh, to provide better outcomes with less utilization, hospitalization, and skilled nursing care, and with a very high satisfaction. In New York State, there's over 5,500 individuals that are enrolled in PACE, uh, and over 55,000 nationwide in 31 states. So as we mentioned, uh, PACE is an integrated uh, model with Medicare and Medicaid, and it's considered the gold standard. And I, I mentioned here, um, during the pandemic, there was so much discussion about the institutional settings and the outcome. And many of the policymakers and people in the community said, I wish we had a program that brought together the services of a nursing home, but allowed people to remain in the community and integrated the social de determinants of health uh, and other community-based sports system. And it, it just drives me crazy that PACE is not better known across the country because everything that they're asking for is provided in the PACE model. This is truly uh, a holistic and complete approach that brings all of those services and opportunities together to provide for the best care plan uh, for the individuals that uh, we serve. Here in New York State, the policy directive is to get all of the duly eligibles into an integrated model. And New York State has selected PACE and MAP, which is a Medicaid Advantage plan, as the two opportunities for people to participate in integrated models. A MAP, however, is a telephonic model. Uh, not even uh, remotely resembling the opportunities that PACE presents both as a provider and a hands-on care coordinator. 
Uh, we were pleased that uh, President Biden included PACE in his federal legislation, Better Care, Better Jobs Act, as a home and community-based program. We're hoping that this gets passed as $400 billion will flow towards home and community-based services. I really um, believe that uh, the transformation from institutional care to home and community-based care was accelerated by at least 10 years by the pandemic. We were already moving from institutional-based services to community based on consumer preferences. Uh, but because of the pandemic, uh, people really understand what you can successfully do in the community versus what they thought could only be done in an institution. And PACE has demonstrated that it is the model uh, that can achieve the outcome that consumers are looking for. Uh, during the pandemic, about 1.6% of PACE uh, participants died of complications with COVID compared to 3.4% of nursing home and assisted living uh, residents. So it's definitely uh, demonstrated as a more successful model uh, and one that the, the members prefer. Uh, what we're trying to do to continue the expansion of PACE and make it more of a uh, broader population-based solution for duly eligibles is proposing uh, some a demo to the office of CMMI that would allow for the enrollment of Medicare-only beneficiaries into the PACE program. Currently, you have to be Medicaid-only or Medicare and Medicaid. And what we wanna do is allow the PACE program to catch those individuals who are on the verge of uh, either spending down and going on Medicaid or having an acute episode, which requires them to be institutionalized. And we believe the model that we're proposing to CMMI allows them to buy in at different levels for their Medicaid benefit uh, and receive their Medicare um, uh, benefit at the same time. We also think that some flexibility in enrollment and the time frame that it takes to get someone enrolled in PACE will help us accelerate uh, the expansion and the opportunity for the people we want to serve to join this uh, program. So as I said, New York State is focused on ways to integrate care at lower costs. Uh, I, I always am disappointed that the first part of the discussion is always about lower costs. Uh, people are looking to transform the healthcare system and to provide a solution to duly eligibles. And you know, other individuals are able to pay for concierge level medical services. PACE actually provides self directed, physician-driven, home-based care in a concierge level of service to Medicaid and Medicare beneficiaries. It, it's just an uh, incredible opportunity that uh, we need to focus on the expansion of. Uh, on average, PACE does pay about 15% less than it would cost for a fee-for-service participant uh, out in the community. There's about 605,709 New Yorkers that are eligible for PACE. Uh, and they're certainly the highest cost drivers of healthcare in the state. So we wanna get the policymakers to work with us, understand the opportunity that PACE provides, provide the flexibility we need, the creativity we need, and to support it through capital investments and the funding necessary to um, expand the program. In order to increase the access of PACE to more individuals, uh, we need to get more awareness of PACE and reduce some of these barriers that uh, Medicare only enrollment would help to solve. We had a PACE Innovation Act passed in 2015. Um, some members of this panel were instrumental in getting that done under the Obama administration. It kind of sat dormant during the Trump administration and now is the time to get that act out and to use it as an opportunity to expand and grow the PACE program. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Peter. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, and I'm gonna ask for my slides to come up. 
Um, while they're coming up, I just want to express my appreciation to um, Dr. Cortez and Dr. Sullivan Marks for this panel. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to spread the word about PACE and share with you where we hope the program is going. I'm gonna pick up on some of the topics that Scott raised and in preparing for the panel, I really wanted to focus on the question of what are the limitations and powers of policy to increase access to more effective programs for uh, high need, high cost populations. And I think the PACE program provides an, an excellent case study of that, um, particularly in light of current conversations going on in Congress and with the administration regarding expanded access to home and community-based uh, services. So actually, if we could just go to the next slide. Um, you know, if, if in, as part of the conversations that Congress is having right now about expanded access to home and community-based programs, if there were a proposal to create a new program with all of the features that you see listed here on the slide, and these uh, should sound familiar to you, because they, uh, Scott was summarizing them with regard to PACE. But if we saw a proposal to create a new program that integrated Medicare and Medicaid coverage, was fully at risk and provider-based, comprehensive in its approach to care, including medical, LTSS, social determinants of health, and was designed for a high need, high cost population, I think we would view that proposal as groundbreaking. And, and yet, that very proposal was passed back in 1997 when PACE was created as part of the Balanced Budget Act. And if I could just go to the next slide. Um, so we have now had PACE on the books as a permanent Medicare program and a state plan option for Medicaid for over 24 years. And it's interesting to see what that time frame tells us about the power and limitations of policy to change the delivery of health care. And worth noting that PACE didn't emerge de novo in 1997, uh, as many current proposals uh, that are being considered uh, are emerging without the benefit of prior uh, development and, and replication. So in fact, the PACE care model was created in Onlock back in 1970. There were replications to see if that Onlock model that was working in San Francisco could work in other communities and then PACE was made a permanent program. So even with the benefit of a pretty long developmental history and then the benefit of becoming permanent under legislation, where are we today with regards to making this PACE program that does embody so many of the features that healthcare reform is seeking? Where are we with actually making that, that program accessible? If we could just go to the next slide. And when we talk about accessible, accessible means bringing this program to scale so that more people can access it. And I'm not gonna go through this slide in any detail because Scott summarized it nicely, but really I think it's important to stay uh, mindful that access translates into better care and better quality of life for people. So we're not just talking about growing a program abstractly, we're talking about increasing access in a way that can make a difference uh, for people in their lives. Generally, we know a few things after 24 years in the creation of PACE. The first thing that we know is that the healthcare system is resistant to change and fractured care and state variations continue. If we look at the roughly 7.7 .7 million full benefit dual eligibles, only about 50,000 of them are enrolled in PACE today. That's less than 1%. And when you add in the other uh, variations that integrate Medicare and Medicaid coverage, we only get to 8% of those full benefit dual eligibles. And some have looked at this statistic uh, and been discouraged to say, well, basically um, PACE and potentially some of these other models are just not scalable to, um, to reach the level of need that we have in the country. But I think that that ignores the actual breakdown of those 7.7 .7 million and particularly with regard to PACE. Um, as you can sort of see in the progression of pie charts here, if we actually focus on the full benefit dual eligibles who are eligible for PACE in terms of age and needing a nursing home level of care and have the opportunity to enroll in PACE in terms of the states that they live in because we're currently only in 30 of the 50 states, it looks like right now PACE is providing integrated care to 38% of the individuals that are actually getting integrated care. So I think that that is promising uh, with regard to the scalability of the model. 
And if we also look at state level of adoption of PACE in the next slide, we can see that PACE is actually by, by a considerable length um, the most adopted integrated care model out there right now with 30 states having PACE, 10 retaining the financial alignment um, demonstrations, FIDA SNPs in 11 states, and MLTS, Medicaid Managed Long-Term Service and Support Plans with dual eligible special needs plan wraparounds in 10 states. So on some level, I think we have seen success with the PACE care model, but we can't ignore the fact that we have a long way to go, going back to that 55,000 people out of 7.7 .7 million. And if we look at the totality of um, people who need long-term services and supports in this country, it's more like 10 to 12 million. So if I could just go to the next slide, which provides a snapshot of where we are uh, in terms of coverage as well. So in that LTSS population, about more than 75%, so more than three quarters are Medicare only, and Scott touched on this, and yet less than 1% of the people served in PACE are Medicare only. So not only are we dealing with a small number with regard to the total population, it is particularly small with regard to the Medicare only population needing LTSS. You can go to the next slide. Um, in terms of where we're at today operationally and the role that operations can play in expanding access, we have an average enrollment per PACE program of 420, but PACE programs have demonstrated their ability to operate at significantly larger scale than that. The largest PACE organization enrolls 3,000 people, and we have nine PACE organizations serving more than 1,000 participants each. Um, we have no geographic access in 20 states, and in the states that do have PACE, the uh, level of access varies because some programs only have, some states only have one PACE program, others have many. But we have seen in six states the ability to create geographic access for more than 50% of those states' residents. Um, and I have to give a shout out to Rhode Island, which is close to 99% access to uh, PACE in that state. Uh, operationally, on average, PACE programs are serving about 10% of the number of people that live in their service area. Um, and it's higher, actually, in rural and small markets where um, access to other home community-based alternatives is much more limited. And we see PACE organizations in those rural and small market areas uh, achieving uh, uh, market penetration levels of close to 20% on average. So um, turning to policy. Uh, we, at the, as part of the PACE 2.0 project, we are looking at different strategies to increase access to PACE. And we have these three different growth streams uh, you see here in green, orange, and gray. Green is scaling up PACE organizations that currently operate and moving them from an average enrollment of 420 up to something closer to like 600. Um, the orange band represents bringing more PACE programs to more communities in order to increase access. And that gray band represents opportunities such as the one that uh, Scott described through PACE pilots to expand uh, PACE access to new populations. Wait, go to the next slide. And while we can address many of those issues uh, and challenges operationally, uh, our success will to a significant extent depend on the policy levers that are held at the federal and state level. And there is a great deal that the federal and state level that policymakers could do to facilitate entry into the program, to facilitate the startup of new programs and to uh, provide opportunities through pilots for new populations to gain access to the PACE care model. Just go to the next slide, please. I think it's my last slide. I'm not gonna go through these right now in detail, but I wanted to share with you that the National PACE Association has put forward a PACE access agenda uh, addressing policy changes that would facilitate increased access in each of these areas, uh, helping current programs grow, bringing new programs to new communities and serving new populations. And we very much look forward to working with Congress and the Biden administration to um, pursue these policy solutions. And I don't have it here on my slide, but I, I can't conclude without referencing the Better Care, Better Jobs Act uh, and the potential new funding that that would create. I think in the um, immortal words of Cindy Lauper's 
hit money changes everything. If we saw an infusion of $400 billion into home and community-based alternatives um, and PACE would be eligible for some of that funding, I think it could really uh, fundamentally change the efforts that go into access, accessing PACE. So I'll stop there and I very much look forward to your questions and the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Eileen, Scott, Rob, Peter, it's really very, very interesting remarks. And I think it's given us a lot to think about. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested, um, Peter, to look at some of the things that you had just said about the access to care and the expansion. And some of the questions, as I look in the Q&A box, people are asking, well, you know, it's been around for so long. How come it's only 55,000 people? How do we increase access? But the big, I think a big elephant in the room is also how do we pay for it? Because as I think it was Scott who said about the 15% lower um, reimbursement rate for um, PACE programs than for other long-term support services. How do we get a model that is sustainable because there is enough, um, enough funding coming into it to sustain it? And number two is how do we increase access? Because in some ways they go hand in hand. You can't access without uh, adequate resources. Uh, you can get adequate resources if you have more people coming in, but how does all this fit together? Let's start with you, Peter, and then um, the rest of the other panelists can chime in. Yeah, um, I, you know, I think the, the, the PACE financing model is durable and it has proven its success. You know, one of the concerns I think is often that for a relatively small risk pool that PACE programs have and a very high acuity population, is that um, a financially sustainable model? And we've been operating under that financial model now for over 24 years as a permanent program. So I think it's, it's sustainable from the operations and financing of the program itself. Um, I think that the investment in creating new programs has in the past been daunting to, to many because PACE programs, when they first open their doors, have to have a fully operational PACE center and a fully operational interdisciplinary team. And they may begin that first month with five enrollees. So it takes a year and a half to two years uh, for, that, for that enrolled population to reach a level that is operationally sustainable. So starting a new program requires investment up front in the PACE center and the development of this staff. And then it requires working capital to keep the program going while you build your way towards um, being operationally sufficient. Uh, so I, I guess what I see is very hopeful signs is I see a lot of not-for-profit PACE sponsors such as Scott's organization really starting to invest in the expansion of the model. And we're also seeing, I think with less clear results where this will go, we are starting to see more for-profit interest in investing in PACE. Um, so Dr. Cortez, I don't know if that was your question. I mean, I think it's going to take two things. We're going to need access to capital up front to start and expand programs. But I think we do have a, a financially sustainable payment model in place right now. And I'll ask uh, maybe Dr. Schreiber or uh, Mr. LaRue if they want to comment on that as well. Well, this is Eileen Sullivan Marks. I hope you can still hear me. Um, yeah. To that question, um, one of the things we looked at, uh, why hasn't uh, PACE expanded um, when I was senior fellow at CMS in 2010, 2012, um, is that it is the risk that one has to assume. And in states, because of Medicaid, uh, where a will at the state level that is what made a great deal of difference in expanding space in those areas. So you're hearing from people who are involved on this panel in different states, and that's very important for the Medicare Medicaid model. So the Medicare only model may help to address uh, that one uh, barrier in particular. Just to add to what's been said, I would say that one of the other challenges is the model is so very different than anything that exists now 
in medical care. Having been you know, in geriatrics for 37 years, I will tell, and I've seen almost every model there is, the PACE model even took me by surprise in terms of the intricacies and the approach that was required. Uh, and so that, that's one big piece. I do think though, that as we get to value-based care and we're seeing systems of care grow bigger and bigger, that you're looking at, we're gonna be looking at population dynamics and looking at models that are gonna best serve populations. So I do think that there is a push for large systems of care, um, you know, the, some of these academic centers, um, and Scott maybe can talk about um, his partnership or uh, relationship with Montefiore hospital system, but there is this opportunity now to really invest, but it's not, you know, historically PACE has been, as you know, Peter showed 420 participants in a center. We need thousands of participants. We need, you know, like, 500 PACE programs with over a thousand people in them. And to actually start a PACE center is one thing, to scale it and grow it requires a whole different level and getting off the ground. This is a marathon that we're involved with, not a sprint. So you really need to have a population level dynamics where you can actually make the business case, make the investment to actually grow these programs over time. And I think that's the other piece that we're, you know, that is new now that may influence the growth phase. Scott? Uh, I'll just make a couple of points. So in terms of the, the hospital partnerships, it, it also goes to the capital costs. So what we're trying to do is identify ways that we could partner uh, with hospital systems or existing infrastructure in the community versus rebuilding it as the pace center, as a pace center. Uh, an example would be if there's an existing Article 28 clinic in the community or a day center in the community, we, we could partner and use that as one of our, a part of our PACE program. And the PACE Innovation Act uh, allows for that kind of flexibility. And we're seeing that flexibility at the state and, and federal level because uh, I think they're supportive of uh, trying to scale, um, scale the PACE program up. The other thing I'd mention is I think what also has inhibited the growth, you know, what's made PACE so successful is you got a care team of 11 people taking care of 250 or so people. It's a very intimate relationship that makes PACE work. And, and that's been hard to um, expand and still maintain that level of intimacy with the people you serve. But the, the pandemic and the, the demos that have been out there, the hospital-based programs, you know, hospitals at home, you're doing dialysis at home. Who would have thought you would have had home-based dialysis? So I think the pandemic has changed consumer preferences and policymakers are understanding that you can provide quality care in a home-based setting uh, without putting someone in an institution. And I'm optimistic that that's gonna help uh, us grow the PACE program. Thank just you. to add to just add to what Scott said, what we found, which was absolutely fascinating and, and really reinforces Scott's point, we had a number of organizations, including assisted livings and supportive housing providers that had our participants living in them that were like inviting us to come into the sites in, in the, you know, the midst of the pandemic when others would not be allowed, we were allowed to come in and the care um, and outcomes were so much better that now these organizations are actually reaching out to us to see how they can partner, you know, in a more, you know, inclusive way. And so I think um, the model actually, you know, by leading by example, we were able to show the impact was dramatically improved for an individuals. And, you know, how many, you know, for individuals in the audience, if they had, you know, family members, uh, their parents that had issues, how many of them actually got to see a physical therapist? How many of them actually got to see a social worker? How many of them actually were able to get health aides checking in on them on a weekly basis or a provider coming in on a weekly basis into the home and being able to provide care? And I think that, you know, that's 
that's the difference. That's why, and that's why it's so critical. I think that PACE needs to really expand. Well, I see looking at a question here from the audience and, um, and I, I think uh, Mr. LaRue, you could best uh, start off this discussion. If increased size is critical to sustainability, how do you see PACE playing out in the more rural, less populated areas? And you have basically, you've had PACE programs across three boroughs in New York City and now you've moved up into the Westchester area and um, and beyond. And I'm just wondering how the differences are. What are the differences in um, opening up a PACE program in a less populated area? You're on mute. That's an interesting question, Dr. Cortez. And I think I'm gonna kick that over to Peter because Peter is gonna be more familiar with what I would call a rural PACE program. and our PACE programs, I would not define as uh, uh, rural, but it, you know, it is very difficult in, a, in that kind of a community setting, but there are PACE programs that are uh, successful in doing that. And I, I'd let Peter respond. All right. Yeah, there are, um, there are really two kinds of PACE organizations serving rural communities. There are entirely rural programs where their whole service area is rural. And then we have programs that operate what we call a hub and spoke model, where they have an urban-based PACE program service area, and then they have spokes extending into rural areas. So that, that is one strategy for making sure that your rural program is viable with a look that where you might have a lower enrollment level in the rural area, but you're adding that to a larger program. Um, though we have seen PACE organizations be very successful that operate entirely in rural service areas. And I think part of the reason for that it's what I mentioned in my opening comments, there are simply fewer home and community-based alternatives in those areas. And so um, the PACE organization ends up serving a much larger percentage of, of the population that needs LTSS. Uh, operationally, I think you can, you'll can you see a few differences. Um, one, we see more extensive use of community-based primary care physicians in rural areas. So PACE programs, in addition to their own staff primary care, can partner with community-based primary care practices. And so that allows access to primary care closer to where the individual lives in what can be these very large but not densely populated geographic areas. Um, and secondly, I think just much more extensive use of telehealth uh, to deliver care to people in their homes in, across those rural areas. Okay. I think the other option, which has not been done, but I think um, we, we can't really talk about outreach to populations without housing. And so many of the individuals in rural areas, um, if there was a housing uh, complex attached to a PACE program in a rural area so people could stay in their community, stay safe, um, there would be the opportunity opportunity if telehealth or outreach was not successful or people needed significantly more care than could be provided by having actual, you know, affordable housing connected to a PACE center, that could be another way to really expand PACE in rural areas. So people may not be able to stay actually in their home, but would be able to stay in their community and would be able to live a life meaning and still have those connections um, in, a, in a positive way. So I think you know, that's the innovation aspect that PACE allows us to think about and it needs to be studied. But I think there's a lot of opportunity to really think out of the box and do things in ways that would promote people aging in place in the communities in which they live. I, thank you. I'm going to I'm going to wrap up with one final question, and it's I, it's a big one. So uh, we'll go around to each panel member. But if we were to share with our audience, we had uh, over 250 people enrolled, registered for this, and we've had as many as 146, I believe, participating in this. What would you say to our participants they could do to impact or influence or help? all of us move forward a, a, an expansion of the PACE program. And, you know, I'm gonna tie, I'm gonna end with you, Peter, cause you're the policy wonk. So we'll go around and end with you, but we'll start with Rob, Scott, Eileen, and then end up with Peter. So I think the one thing I would, if I had pick one thing, I would say for individuals that have never been to a PACE center to actually spend time there 
to actually spend a morning and actually see how the team works um, and also to get a chance to talk to participants at the center. It would be uh, mind blowing and mind changing. I will tell you, um, we've had physicians, leaders, you know, people doing healthcare for many, many years coming to a PACE program, and it is just, they've never seen anything like it, and it sticks with them. So that's, that would be the one practical thing that people could do. Thank you. Scott. I would say public advocacy and uh, awareness about PACE, because uh, PACE participants love the program, and uh, it seems like every time there's a public uh, policy or some legislation, I'm always raising my hand and saying, don't forget about PACE. Uh, we've got to get beyond saying, don't forget about PACE and have it be on the forefront of people's thinking as they're uh, developing uh, policy uh, for the people we serve. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sullivan Marks. I, you know, we're all thinking along the same way. I think grassroots um, intervention at the community level um, for people who are aware of PACE and then taking that to other stakeholders. But um, visiting PACE, being a part of PACE, once it gets the attention of stakeholders, including um, people with the uh, money to back it, um, I think is incredibly important. And so I think the visit it, but also uh, bring it to the local community levels to get uh, folks interested. All right, and Mr. Fitzgerald, if you would wrap it up with policy and what we can do to help move so much of your efforts. Uh, yeah, I, well, I agree with everything everyone has said. I, I think we're at, a key time in the development of the healthcare system where we have the opportunity to embrace provider-based models that are that demonstrated their ability to do population health management and to address the social determinants of health. And I think PACE is at the forefront of those provider-based models. So I would encourage everybody, depending on your role in the healthcare system, if you are a provider, to embrace PACE as a provider-based model for population health management. If there's no PACE program in your community to consider developing one. And if you're a policymaker, to look at the options that PACE provides in terms of expanding access to a fully integrated program with a demonstrated ability to do population health management for one of the most challenging populations we have in this country. So um, I think it's really just starting to look again at, at providers and putting and putting them at the center of creating the change in the healthcare system we're seeking. Thank you. And I, I would just uh, add as a closing remark, the time is now. Uh, you know, we've watched, we've talked about the baby boomers, we've talked about the exploding older population. We're in the midst of it right now and it's getting bigger and bigger every day. So we don't have the facilities, the resources to continue to do care as we always have. PACE is innovative. PACE is something that has not really caught on the way it needs to catch on. And uh, as someone wrote in the chat box, let's not forget about older adults. I think that uh, we really have to be on top of our policy makers and our, and our, our, um, our Congress, uh, 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 congressmen and senators to make sure that aging is a major uh, concern in this country. And we need to be sure that we're offering a cost-effective way to provide better health outcomes and better health. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to our panelists. You've been wonderful. Thank you for this very, very stimulating conversation. And thank you for all of you who have participated. We'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you so much. <laughs>